Good morning. I'd like to invite Sage Emery forward to recite the Lord's Prayer for us this morning. Sage. Tukua taku wairua, kia rere ki nga taumata, hei arahi yaku mahi, me taku whae te reo Māori, kia mau, kia ita, kia koroa e ngaro, kia pūpuri, kia whaka maua, kia tīnga tīna, haumie huie tāe kie. Thank you, Sage. Please be seated, gentlemen. This morning's guest as the uh, presentations for Leadership Week continue is another old boy. We have uh, Squadron Leader Costley here joining us this morning. Uh, and Squadron Leader Costley has had a distinguished career thus far in the, uh, in the Air Force. In 2003, Squadron Leader Costley deployed on his first operational tour to Henderson Field in Honiara as part of the Regional Assistance Mission to the Solomon Islands. During this tour, he received a Theatre Commander's Commendation for his work, work both in flying and in organising a large number of events over Christmas in 2003. Later in 2009, Squadron Leader Costley successfully completed the Flying Instructor's Course at the Central Flying School and was awarded the Canteen Cup for Best Academic Result on Course. On graduation, he was posted to the Pilot Training Squadron as a qualified flying instructor. At the start of 2010, Squadron Leader Costley was sent on short notice deployment to Afghanistan, where he was working for the New Zealand SAS. He worked as the liaison officer between the SAS Task Force and the US 82nd Airborne Headquarters, as well as all the aviation forces deployed to Regional Command East at Bagram Air Base. In 2011, Squadron Leader Costley was promoted to that Squadron Leader's position and moved to the J-75 training section, responsible for coordinating and planning all exercises and major rotary wing activities. In 2013, Squadron Leader Costley was posted back to the pilot training squadron as the flight commander or second in command. In this role, he was, he was responsible for all the instructors, the students, the flying operations and ground-based training that takes place. During this time, Squadron Leader Costley qualified as an A-category flying instructor and he also served as equerry to His Royal Highness the Duke of Cambridge during the 2014 Royal Visit to New Zealand. From August 2014 to August 2015, Squadron Leader Costley completed his senior staff course at the Defence Academy in the United Kingdom, gaining a Master of Science in International Defence and Security. Squadron Leader Costley was given the award for best overall student in the Masters programme and his thesis on how New Zealand can make a meaningful contribution to coalition operations was awarded best thesis. So it's my pleasure to introduce Squadron Leader Costley to the school this morning. Uh, thank you, Rector. Um, Sort of when you word it like that, it sounds all right, but uh, I was searching through the garage the other day, we've been packing up to move house, and I found some photos from my time at school, uh, which may or may not appear <coughs> classy, eh? Um, uh, from my time at school, uh, clearly no sense of uh, fashion in bow ties. Uh, the one on the left, actually, believe it or not, that's me going to my sixth form school ball. I look about 12, but that's all right. Uh, the one on the right, you can blame Mr Young for, uh, they chose that uniform for the school trip to uh, music trip to Australia in 1994. Um, sadly, you can't blame him for the choice of curtains that my parents went for in the background. Um, that just shows you, it'll be a surprise obviously for you to find out I didn't have a girlfriend when I was at school from the look of those photos. Uh, but I found this photo as well from, from the music trip uh, to Australia, which I think sums up my time at high school. Uh, pretty well. If you look carefully, it's not a great photo. This is about all the technology we had down there. Mr King did his best. Um, you can actually see underneath that shirt I've got on my blue Albion singlet. Uh, I never wore a singlet to school before this day. I never wore one after. And the reason I was wearing it this day is because at lunchtime I knew we had to change into our shirts uh, to have these photos taken. And basically I just wanted to hide my man boobs. Um, and, and so I wore that to try and hide, and uh, I think that sort of sums up at what I did at school pretty well. 
Uh, I didn't really stand out. Uh, you can see, um, basically, I skipped every PE period from the start of fourth form onwards, uh, which is probably why I ended up wearing a singlet that day. Um, uh, and I went and hid in the music block during PE classes, and I don't know how I got away with it for the rest of my time at high school, but I did. But as a result, uh, say in the fourth form road race, we had to do an eight kilometre road race back then, I don't know if you still do it. So I don't know, there's about 300 fourth form students, there's probably half a dozen that didn't finish. Of the ones that did finish, I was pretty much dead last. Um, not morbidly obese, but a little bit flabby, uh, hence the singlet. Uh, and due mostly, as you can see, what did I do? Music band, school activities, music group, other activities, music, not a lot of physical fitness going on. Um, but I did achieve a couple of things during my time here. Uh, I won the prize for top of uh, what would have been our year 11 German. If we're honest, I was the only year 11 German student, but I still got a prize. Uh, year 12, I won the Year 12 Bursary Music Prize. Again, I was the only Year 12 Bursary Music student. Uh, and so it's probably no surprise that in Year 13, I won the Year 13 Music Prize. And uh, due to timetabling issues, again, a class of one. So um, won some prestigious awards. You won't see me on any of the honours boards around the school. But thanks to my selection of subjects, I won these prizes. And what happened back then is you got a $20 Whitcalls voucher. Uh, now, I'm rubbish at reading, a really slow reader, couldn't read books. Doc O'Connor gave me uh, zero out of 20 in the poetry section of my mid-year um, year 13 exam. Um, not even error carried forward, I thought that was harsh. Uh, and I only passed because I got scaled up from 46 to 51. So I went to Wickles, I thought, I don't know what to do, I don't, I don't read books. Um, but ever since I was about seven years old, my dad had taken me out to air shows and I thought, I, I knew that I wanted to be a, an Air Force pilot. So Dad said, well look, there's this section that you've never seen before called non-fiction, uh, and there's books there about planes and military, and so I found this book called Bravo 2-0, which is about a SAS patrol uh, behind enemy lines in Iraq in the first Gulf War. Uh, and it was really exciting uh, to read, you know, and it was a great book. And, and so as I won these prizes, I'd buy these books about, you know, special forces overseas or pilots and air crew doing their thing with the military. But I reckon as I handed these books in to my teachers as a prize, uh, and as the rector gave them to me at prize giving, that they would have been thinking, well, you know, he might, he might like the story, but he'll never be a part of it. You know, he might like to read these books, but he'll never actually go and live them out. And yet about 12 years after I uh, bought that book, Bravo 2.0, uh, as the rector said, I was in Afghanistan as an Air Force pilot working for our SAS. Uh, now I get some slightly cooler... Um, work photos from my 15 years in the Air Force. That's in East Timor, but also peacekeeping uh, overseas in the Solomon Islands, Afghanistan, uh, Papua New Guinea, working in New Zealand with uh, special forces, with police, a bunch of counter-terrorist training. Um, teaching new guys to fly has been awesome, and formation aerobatics, flying close to other planes upside down, and, and flying at air shows around New Zealand. It's been an amazing time. But I don't think it's, it's what any of my teachers would have maybe expected me to have gone on uh, and done. What does that have to do with leadership? Well, probably if you've sat through this week and, and other weeks during your time at the school, I'm sure some people have come in and said, you know, leadership is a science. You can teach people, follow these three or four steps and then you'll be a, a good leader. And some other people will come in and say, no, 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 leadership is an art. Either you've got it or you don't. And there's bits of all of that that's true. But I guess the thing I want to say today is that leadership is a decision. And it's a decision that we make. If you want to lead many, first of all, you've got to lead one person, yourself. And so I think leadership starts with us making decisions on a daily basis. It might be the decision about how we talk about other guys in our class behind their backs. Uh, it might be the decision about the kind of things that we get involved with. For me, if I wanted to be an Air Force pilot, I had to make a bunch of decisions. To start with, the slightly chubby little fourth former had to learn to run around the block. So that meant daily making choices to go out and to get fit. Now, since then I've run a couple of marathons and a, and a bunch of half marathons. I didn't even think I could do that back then. But it was those daily decisions to go and do that week in, week out. So I had to pass the fitness test. Um, once I'd done that, the next thing I had to do was learn to swim. If you want to be a pilot, you've got to pass the swim test. 
right? So as a 20 year old, I still couldn't swim. And my mate Mike took me down to the Lido in town and, uh, and I would try and swim up and down the pool, sort of on about that angle with my feet dragging along the bottom. Mike would literally have to walk along next to me, grab the back of my togs and lift my ass up out of the water, walking up and down the pool next to me as I would slowly try and splash my way down the pool. Well, eventually I got there uh, and I passed the swim test. Probably not my proudest moment of my uh, <coughs> final year at university. Anyway, into the Air Force. First had to get through basic and then sort of officer training. Um, the last leadership assessment that I had, it was awesome. We got dropped in by helicopter. We had to go and, I don't know, capture some hilltop or something. We had a Herc load drop earlier in the day and then we had this enemy helicopter flying around trying to shoot us and when we got there, these two Air Force you know, jets, Skyhawks, came screaming through and blew the, blew the place up and then we went in and did whatever we did, pretending to be in the army or something. Uh, and then, um, we didn't know what we're doing really, but we fired a lot of bullets. Um, and then we got picked up by helicopter and flown home. It was awesome, but I pushed myself so hard that at the end of it I was in bed sick for, for 24 hours. But I knew that I wasn't going to let any of these obstacles get in the way. The final one after that, there's a few little courses you do before starting, but the final big one was survival training which is basically a couple of weeks of learning how to be hypothermic and really hungry in the forest in the middle of winter. Um, so anyway, we got through that, and at the end they say, look, you guys haven't eaten for a long time, so just have a little bit of bread, a bit of water, take it easy, let your body get used to food again. We're having none of that. It's been like a week and a half since we'd eaten. So we, uh, my mate and I went down to the local West Gate, big feed of McDonald's, raced around the supermarket, got everything we could, went to Burger King on the way home, uh, it was awesome until about halfway home we realised why they said not to eat anything and we just made it back to base in a functioning toilet in the nick of time. It wasn't functioning for very long. But um, all of these things are just challenges that get put in our way and I remember every time that I was doing, struggling my way through another press up or running up a hill or another night in the bush in the cold, I was just thinking do I want to be a pilot? If I want to make it then this is what we're going to get through and we're just going to do this one step at a time. Um, you know, I think, I don't know what it's like at school now, but when I was at high school, it's really easy to focus on things like position and performance. Who's in the top stream? Who's in the first 15? Who's a, who's a prefect? Who's the head prefect? All those sort of positions that seem to have importance, or, 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 um, or performance, you know, what do we score on an exam? What was your average uh, for the season? How many points did you score? Uh, all those kind of things. And I think position and performance ha have a place uh, of importance, but I think more important than position and performance is, is the person. And, and by that I mean is your character. And when we talk about uh, things like making these decisions, you know, and for me it was a case of you know, really perseverance, determination, we're going to overcome each of these obstacles uh, as they come along. And that's really about building our character. You're, um, you, you can be the captain of the first 15. You can be a prefect, head prefect. You can even be the rector. That might make you in charge of something. That might make you the boss. It might mean you can tell people what to do. But that doesn't make you a leader. It's your character that will make you a leader. And it's your character that will shine through. Raw talents, a bit of good luck, knowing the right people, being in the right place at the right time, that will only get you so far. I mean, you think about a guy like, I don't know, let's, let's go for the cliche example, but a Richie McCaw. When he selected as captain, he hadn't scored the most points. He hadn't been in the team the longest. But he's picked because of his character. And it's his character that makes him one of the great leaders. Not because he was captain for the longest time, but because of the kind of person that he is. And, and that's what's going to make the difference, I think, for you guys moving forward. It's going to be your character. You know, for me, when I think about uh, leadership in the Air Force and, and trying to think of an example to use, it's not of being in charge of, I don't know, a deployed helicopter force around New Zealand. It's not being in charge of a, a squadron or something like this. One of the, one of the challenges, um, I guess the leadership challenges I've had, we're setting up a charity called the Missing Wingman Trust, which is the charity that looks after Air Force families when someone is killed uh, or injured or wounded. Um, so when I was in Afghanistan at the start of 2010, I'd been there about a week when a friend back home got killed in, a, in an aircraft crash and left behind a little boy, about four months old at the time, 
uh, and his wife. And we'd both just sort of had our first kids at the same time. And it became pretty obvious that there wasn't actually a charity that would look after this family. There's some initial support when someone dies, high profile sort of accident, but there's nothing after that. So I decided that we needed to set up a charity that would look after Air Force families. And now there's about 30 families from the last six years that we're looking after. And you'd sort of think that that would be easy and everyone would want to jump on board. But actually there's challenge after challenge along the way. And again, you know, as you're lying awake at night trying to work out what are we going to do, plenty of times where it would be easy to just sort of let this thing drift away. Plenty of times that you can get discouraged and want to give up. But again, it was making those daily decisions to keep going. Um, we're at the point now that, that you know, we've been able to put kids through university and when his little boy is 18 in another 12 years' time, you know, we want to put him through university and, and do a bunch of stuff in between now and then. But again, it takes that, that daily challenge each day. So what's the, what's the point of all this? Come back to that photo at the, at, at, at the start. I don't think any of my teachers really thought that guy was, was going to go and achieve particularly much, certainly not on the field that I wanted to. But I'd known from a young age that that's what I wanted to do. In fact, when I found this picture, there was one more line at the bottom where it said, what do you want to do when you get older? And I knew for me, even back then, that I wanted to be an Air Force pilot. And I was going to do whatever it took. So yeah, I think self-belief is important. And I think self-belief leads us to make those daily decisions, to go and do those things that we want to do. It doesn't matter what you want to do. You want to be the Prime Minister, you want to captain the All Blacks, you want to be the, the teacher, you want to be the best damn social worker that this country's seen, you want to solve the housing crisis. There's a stack of stuff left to do in this country. There are a stack of opportunities out there. And it's about believing that you can do it and then making those decisions. And as we make those decisions, as we commit to that, and as we persevere, that builds our character. And it's our character that will make us a leader. It's our character that will shine through, and it's our character that will take us from being a high performance, uh, some high performer, to a leader. The difference between the great all-black leaders and the great players. And actually there is a difference, and it's our character. And that's what I think it is for us. I believe you guys can do it, and I know that because I was sitting down there for five years when I wasn't hiding out the back in the music block. And I know what it's like to, to be the guy that, that, that maybe the person next to you thinks, ah, oh, not, not him. He, he probably won't do it. But you know deep down inside that you will. And that's the first step of, of working our way there. At lunchtime today, we're going to bring one of our new NH90 helicopters onto the, onto the sports fields. If what you want to do uh, is around flying, is around being in the military, maybe the Air Force flying helicopters, fixing aeroplanes, the logistics for them, then I'd love to, um, to see you guys out there at lunchtime. We'd love to have a chat with you. Come and have a look through the helicopter um, and, and have a chat and find out what it's about and, and get involved. Because, because if that's what you want to do, there, there's no reason that you can't do it. It doesn't matter what you look like now. It doesn't matter what activities you've done at school. What we've done up until this point doesn't define what we're going to do in the future. And the biggest thing I take away from this photo is, is that the boy doesn't define the man. And, and that what you saw in fifth form, slightly flabby, unsporty Tim doesn't define what, what Tim wanted to do when he left school. A and nor does what you are today define what you're going to do in the future. Self-belief, making those decisions day in, day out, developing our character, that's what's going to make us a leader in the future. And, and that's what's going to take us to, to achieve those dreams. So I want to thank uh, Mr. King, Rector, for having me this morning. Um, and I, I wish you all the best, boys. It's really easy to glance over this and go, yeah, yeah, we've heard this before. But really, if, if, that, little, <laughs> if that photo does inspire you, nothing will. Good luck. Uh, just on behalf of House North Boys High, I'd like to thank you, Squadron Leader Costley, for coming in to speak to us today. I, um, I found it particularly interesting about your point of view of leadership being a decision. Um, we've just got a small gift as a token of our appreciation to thank you for coming today.